You're living your dream. I didn't know that arts could be so artsy. That's right. Like, you're weird, I'm weird too. <laughs> Talk about challenging yourself. Bring it. <laughs> Everyone. Welcome to the Spotlight Academy with me, your host, Gary Gale. And today we're going to be talking to the fabulous, the wonderful Barrett Boa about musicals. Let's all do spins <laughs> in our seats. Barrett Foa is a singer, a dancer, and an actor with an over a decade of experience on and off Broadway. He has appeared on Broadway hundreds of times in shows like Mamma Mia and Avenue Q. Since 2009, he has portrayed Eric Beal on the mega hit TV series NCIS Los Angeles. And he's also been a spotlight judge. And if that weren't enough, he hosted the spotlight grand finale at Walt Disney Concert Hall. How much fun was that? That was such a special memory. I will never forget that. I'm so glad you, you included that. That was oh, yeah. very, it was my first time in the Walt Disney Concert Hall. I didn't ever. know that. Yeah, and I was on stage hosting it. It was mind blowing. Mr. Foa, oh, thank please. you so yeah. much and welcome to the Spotlight Academy. I'm so glad to be here. I feel like I'm already like a part of the family. You are. I love it. It's such a part of my year and my life leading up to, I, I just, I love it. I love going to the performance. I love seeing it. I love judging the kids and they're, I, it's like, how do you choose? Oh, I such know, talent. we'll talk about that in a minute. But okay. Barrett. Yes. Inquiring minds want to know. Oh. Did you always want to be in musical theater? Like, how'd you get started with, you know, that kind of stuff. I went to an all boys, all sports. Sports? Sports. All boys, all sports, eight week sleep away summer camp for about four summers from fourth grade to seventh grade. And I disliked every minute of it, except for the, for the times when I was in the musicals written by a man named Irving Cohen. And we were on a lake. And so he wrote the Phantom of the Lake. <laughs> You know, things like this. And I always wanted to be in it. And I was always like in the chorus somewhere just because I was a little sort of shy and not all there, but it's something I knew I loved. After four years of just not liking this and trying to sort of fit in, my mom was like, do you want to go to an arts camp? Because you seem to like the artsy parts of the sports camp. And I was like, yes, please, yes, please, yes, please. That's what I want to do, yes, yes, yes. How old so, were you? I was then, I was 13. Okay. So then I went to a place called French Woods and I was like Sky Masterson and Guys and Dolls and you know like started getting leads and a lot of like more a lot more confidence and then after a year there I went to Interlochen Arts Camp in upstate Michigan. We love Interlochen. It's right here. For all you people who know this, the state of Michigan is shaped like this. Oh, that's and it's good. Like, yeah. It's this beautiful, gorgeous, life-changing magic place for the arts. Suddenly I wasn't just around musical theater. I was sort of in like my own little spotlight academy. Oh my there God. There was opera people around me and ballet dancers and Shakespearean actors and pottery makers and writers and filmmakers and tuba you players. You found your tribe. Yeah, it was like arts on steroids. Like I didn't know that arts could be so artsy. There's so many different kind of facets and so many places to get specific, you know, like your oboe your violin, people just really get in there. And I'm like, oh, musical theater is just like one of those things that I really have to work towards. I just thought it was sort of a fun thing to do. And then I was like, oh, this is a craft. This is part of something larger. This is called the arts with a capital T, capital A arts. And I sort of fell in love with musical theater in a new and more layered way. I eventually went to the University of Michigan for musical theater. So I stayed in the state of Michigan <laughs> and spent four summers up here at Interlocking and four years at University of Michigan. And then went back to New York. I was born and raised in New York. And I just went back and I basically started working immediately. I was very blessed. And did you, I'm just curious, because we have a lot of students, especially the dancers who experience uh, bullying sometimes as they're growing up. And I'm just curious if you experienced any of that when you were in school at all and like how you got through that. You know, 
summer camp was the not the arts camp the sports camp <laughs> the sports all boy sports camp part was a little rough because i wasn't gung-ho at playing soccer that wasn't really what i wanted to do i would get bullied and teased and it was not fun but eventually i think just finding the arts was almost like safe space for me and then finding those arts in school at camps in places where i was accepted we were all kind of the funny art weirdos who actually knew what they wanted to do yeah and were passionate about something instead of maybe just running around a field which is also wonderful but right? <laughs> but it was fun to just be accepted for the zanies that we were and we all kind of bonded together and banded together and were zany together that's how you collaborate right right you're like you're weird i'm weird too <laughs> let's let's make a play Let's let's write a something, you know, like that's how creativity happens. I love that. Yeah. Do you remember um so when you got to New York, do you remember like what your first audition was like and like <laughs> your laughing? My first audition was for was for the Broadway production of Cats and I was like I'm That was your first audition? That's the first one I remember. Okay. I was like I'm going to get this. And they were like cuz I sort of knew the the person doing the the audition and he had choreographed me in something in summer stock before and he's like come in and i was like i'm gonna be he's like you're you'd be a perfect skimble shanks the railway cat and i was like yeah i would and then i think they asked me to do a single tour no they're like do a double tour but you can do a single tour which is basically what we were doing at the beginning of this interview <laughs> And that's right. Well, that's called a callback. <laughs> and they were like, "It's okay if you do a single; doesn't matter. Just if, as long as it's clean, we don't care." So I did a clean single tour. I was like a pretty good, decent dancer at the time. And they were like, "The people we are cutting include Barrett Foa," and I was like, mm, "Okay, peace out." Anyway, that was not a great story. You can cut that out. But I <laughs> know I like that story. It's important to hear these stories because I think everybody feels like they're going to get out of college and they're going to immediately get on Broadway and get cast. And that doesn't happen all the time. Well, no, it doesn't because I most of the time. Well, because my second audition was for Mamma Mia on Broadway and I got that. No, I'm to I'm just kidding. But it's it oh. sort of it <laughs> One of the first auditions I, did, I had was for Godspell. Which and you I, played I, Jesus, didn't you? Which I, well, spoiler alert, you, you ruined the story. <laughs> okay, let's go back. So tell me about your first audition oh. for Godspell. Oh, sure. Well, Stephen Schwartz was there, which was really cool, who wrote Godspell. And he helped cast it. And lo and behold, they're in the room, we were all the best singers, all the best improvisers, because it was so much improvisation and just stuff from your own experience that you bring to Godspell. The cast ended up being so amazing, and I actually ended up landing the role of Jesus. No! Surprise! <laughs> there were really amazing people were in that cast that went on, like four years later, we were all leads on Broadway. Leslie Kritzer, Shoshana Bean, Chad Kimball, Kapathia Jenkins. We were all babies in this tiny off-Broadway production of Godspell. And then we did a recording of it. And I'm on the front going like this, because I'm Jesus, and that's what he does. Well, <laughs> yes. And then, <laughs> one of the things he does. And then it was just a fun reinvention. It sort of put us all on the map. And that was that was a really exceptional, beautiful experience. Uh, and to have that one of the first things I did in New York was chef's kiss. Do you remember what that opening night was like? Yeah, it was scary because also Jesus has a lot of things to say. <laughs> yes. What's next? Because like he sort of drives the show. Yes. That was a really fun and wonderful experience. And we kept working on it throughout sort of a year, a year long kind of run. And we moved spaces and like upgraded and, and we kind of got extended and it was super special. I do remember the opening night of Mamma Mia on Broadway. I was in the original cast of Mamma And that was that your first Broadway show? My first Broadway show. So people like dream their whole lifetimes of being on Broadway. What was that like when you heard you got the show? It was, <laughs> here's what's cool. Mamma Mia was already a hit before it was on Broadway. So we were actually the fifth company of Mamma Mia. It had already been in London, North America, Canada, Australia, and we were the fifth. So it wasn't one of those like, I hope we do well. It was like, 
I'm stepping into like a guaranteed hit, which was just a sort of a wonderful and safe feeling. But in another way, just sort of an interesting spin on it, there wasn't that like risky, like, oh, is this gonna be good? What is this? What are we doing? Mom, who, ABBA? Like, is, is anyone gonna want? Because we were sort of the one of the first, if not the first, really successful jukebox musicals. And there were a lot of shows that tried to emulate what Mamma Mia did and didn't do it as well, I think. I mean, it's obviously an international phenomenon and has two movies and all of that. But to be in the original Broadway cast of that, it was it was so special, but we sort of knew we were, we had a little cockiness to us. But then opening night comes and you're on Broadway and you feel the curtain go up. What is it like to be on the stage on Broadway, the, something you've been dreaming about probably your whole life yeah. and that curtain goes up and you realize you're living your dream. You are living your dream. And at the same time, all your dreams don't come true just because a curtain goes up. It is inspiring to know, I think, to know all facets of what that is like. And that's, that's why I want to bring that up because I think it's easy to be like, and then all my dreams came true and you can do it too. And you can, and you should go for it. But what's so amazing about life is like, okay, then that happened. Now what? Yes. And you're like, oh, I gotta actually figure that out. The grass is always gonna be greener. And there's always gonna be some other new show or some other role that you wanna tackle. Okay, now I've checked the box of ensemble member in Broadway show, check. Do I stay here for a while and keep getting the paycheck? Cause it's pretty nice. I could just keep being here in the ensemble of Mamma Mia and no one would really know who I was. But then there's a little shiny thing over here that's you could play a part in a show that the guy who wrote Dreamgirls wrote. Do you wanna be in that? Well, yeah, but that's only this many hundreds of dollars a week and it only lasts six weeks and I could be on Mamma Mia forever. And so you sort of have a choice to make and then you sort of have a career to architect. It's interesting, it's like, and life sort of starts unfolding. I just don't sort of want to paint the whole like, once you're on Broadway, all your dreams come true and then you can stop. Life keeps going on and keeps getting richer and, 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 and asking you to do more things and more choices and it gets more wonderful and more difficult and you grow as a human being. And you know what that does? Makes you a better actor. Thank you. Those life experiences, those ups and those downs, you're gonna bring that to the stage and you're gonna have a little more depth in your choices. And it makes you more, it makes you a richer, deeper human being. All of your experiences elevate every aspect of your life. Let's talk about Avenue Q because I'm so intrigued by what that was like with the puppet. <sighs> that was such a special show and such a special audition process. I was the first person to be in puppet camp. Oh my God. Okay, so let me explain. <laughs> okay. Avenue Q started off Broadway and they didn't have understudies off Broadway. Then it moved to Broadway and they realized, wait, we're gonna need understudies. And there's not that many puppeteer people who can also sing and dance and act and be funny and look a certain way and all the things that you need to just do to play the part. And on top of that, be a puppeteer. You know, the puppeteer community in New York is 26 people strong. You know, like, it's, it's not that many. They were like, we have a problem here. We have a hit on our hands. And this is gonna run and we're gonna need understudies and replacements. So we need to tr start training actors, performers, to be puppeteers because you, it's sort of harder to do the, the reverse. A puppeteer may not say that, but okay. I, that's true. <laughs> Apparently they were, what I'm saying is they were having trouble because the pool is smaller. Yeah. That's, all. That's why. That's true. The smaller pool to pull, to pool from. <laughs> How much to pool? There's more performers. So we're like, okay, we can probably, probably get something what we need here and we'll teach them puppeteering and sort of, maybe they can fake it. Let's see. But that's the thing. They didn't really know I was the big guinea pig experiment. Oh my so, God. So, yeah. The, and the first one. So I'm the first person in that building at the Golden Theater to not be a puppeteer and to learn and to understudy and then to take over the role. Puppet um, camp. Puppet camp. Like literally locked in a room with the other guy who was auditioning for it and me and then Rick Lyon who played the original Nicky Trekkie and who designed all the puppets. 
and has been on Sesame Street for a gajillion years. He was the one teaching us the basics of puppeteering so that we could come to our final, final, final audition for the producers. We'd already had like four before that to be like, what's the puppetry like? Can he handle the puppetry? So we know he's the right type. We know he's the right singer. Can he really handle this? And I guess I was a quick learner and I fit the role, got the part. I understudied John Tartaglia for a year. I was not the best puppeteer when I started out, but then I learned and I watched and I had puppet coaches and stuff like this. And I eventually was the first person to take over a role. And then I played the role for a year and a half. It was heaven, but it was so hard. It was was hard, right? It's the puppeteering sort of came easy to me. Just, it's just that role never leaves the stage. If you play Princeton, who's like the ingenue, and then you go off stage and you play Rod, who is this closeted gay Republican, who's like the character role. So you're playing like the romantic lead and the character guy, both. So every time one's not on stage, the other's on stage, and it's still you. Anyway, so fun, but exhausting. My next job, I went right from there. I was performing that Avenue Q at night, and then during the day, I rehearsed for the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. And I was in that show on Broadway, and that was much easier because all you have to do is sit on a bleacher and wait for your name to be called. (laughs) I was like, I like this job. It's a lot less sweaty. I replaced Jesse Tyler Ferguson in that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you remember like your top audition songs for all the shows? Oh, yeah. What were they? She Loves Me from the musical She Loves Me. (laughs) <laughs> I've gotten like every job from that, from that Why song. do you think that's like the, that's, what do you think that's your signature? Let me tell you why, because I think I had my own signature stamp on it. People were like, you really thought this through. You really made it your own. You are- you sing a couple bars for us? Well, I don't know if I could. I didn't like her. Didn't like her, I couldn't, I can't do it, I can't do it. <laughs> When we see students for Spotlight, we always talk about how important it is to go line by line, be super specific. I mean, that's so important. Yes, I had my own spin on it. I understood because he's sort of connecting thoughts as he goes. And so to watch anyone realize something or figure something out during a song is much more interesting to watch than someone who's already got it figured out. Who's just singing about something that they already know. I love you and that's, you know, but if I loved you, you want to see people question. You want to see people figuring things out. You want to see their process process as they're- More interesting than the product, right? Exactly. For for any case of anything. Yeah. We don't want to know where you're headed. We want to see you get there. That to me is the hardest thing ever when when students come in to sing and they've already got in their minds what they are gonna be doing, what they're gonna be, it's all thought out, it's all rehearsed. How do you learn to bring that spontaneity and be in the moment when you're performing? I can tell you, here's what you need to identify. Here's the secret. Okay. How do you wanna end the song? Where do you want to get to? What has that character realized? Great, that's Z. Now you need to figure out all the letters before that and start at A, which is hopefully a very completely different mindset than Z. If you know where you're going, basically choose the opposite thing, start there, and then the way you track that doesn't always have to be the same. Oh. Because it doesn't really matter as long as you're getting to that place. If you've rehearsed every little turn on the way to Z, that's gonna show and that's not spontaneous. But if you sort of know the guideposts, you can hit a few of them, but the way you get there doesn't really matter. So Barrett, yeah. How did you, as an actor, when you're performing a million shows a week, how do you bring that same process? That's another really good question because you do want to be consistent, not only for yourself, but for the conductor, 
for the lighting people, for the stage manager, for your other actors, especially if you're doing something eight times a week. Wow, I don't think I've ever been asked this question. This is a great question. Um, it's important. It is, it really is, because in my mind, what I was just talking about was sort of more of a, like an audition process song, but you're right. Doing a show eight times a week is a whole other job. Once you get the job, then there's a whole other job of maintaining doing the same thing eight times a week and not going absolutely bananas and not having it be a robot doing it every night. Right. Because then your muscle memory starts kicking in and you start getting a little comfy. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, after the show, I have to get cereal. Don't forget about the milk. And you're like, I have not been paying attention to what I was actually saying. <laughs> That's a whole other new job where you gotta, you gotta stay sharp and stay in the moment and listen. That is the secret. Listening, listening, listening. To the other actors too, because- To the other actors. They're going through their own process, which could affect your process. Right. So then you can have that give and take. You can be in the moment because you're not just delivering a line how you delivered it last night. Because if someone else gives you a different Reading. interpretation, yeah. then you're gonna react in a different way. Again, you know where you're going. You know what the ultimate goal is. Just how you get there yeah. can change a little bit along the way. And that's how a role grows and that's how a production sort of grows. Because, and, um, you know, and imagine that, like, if the other actor says to you, like, just the line, I like you, if they say to it, I like you, is going to be different than, I like you, which is going to cause you to react much differently. Completely different ways. Exactly. It's that give and take and that listening that sort of is the key that's going to keep you in the moment. I want to know, you've been on NCIS for a long time. That was a huge transition from live theater to now filmed. And I'm curious, did you miss performing live? What are things that you've really learned about yourself? Do you want to go back? I did very much miss theater. Film and TV are just different animals. The sense of community is different. The consistency is different. You're always doing a new scene. The people, the players might be different. You might be guest starring on a show and just need to drop in do your stuff and get out. You're sort of standing on tape and delivering lines. That sense of listening comes in a lot and the sense of knowing where you're going but the spontaneity of getting there really comes in handy, especially with film and TV because the camera is a lie detector, way more than a theater a relationship with like a live audience can be because you're farther away and there can be a little bit more of theatricality and there can be a little bit more poetic juju. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So whereas like if that, that camera's up in your face, it, it'll tell, it'll, it'll, they'll know if you're lying. Some of that is wonderful. And then there are parts of that that I miss, that I miss that live audience, that I miss I mean, it's what we're all going through right now, right? With, yes. with with the pandemic, we're like, I want my live audience. I want I want applause. I want uh, laughter, and not because I need the ego trip of it. It's just that I want that relationship of like a live. It's a human connection. It's the human connection. It's what we all crave and love, yeah. and we're starving for right now. And we still have to really cultivate that. And I think what we're doing right now is a way of cultivating it in its own modern technology way, <laughs> but live is always better. So in the hiatuses of the show, I've been on the show, this is my 12th year on the show. I basically every summer do theater. I've done an off-Broadway play called Buyer and Seller, which is a 100 minute monologue where I play seven different characters. Talk about challenging yourself. And remember when I said about the listening thing? It's yes. hard when there's no one else to listen to. Keep that in you mind. You can listen like, to the person in the audience unwrapping their I'm, hand. You're like, shh, I'm trying to concentrate. I got a hundred minute monologue to spit out. Uh, then I did Angels in America. Yes. Which I just did last summer, which was one of the most mind blowing experiences I've ever done. I never thought that I'd get to play that role. I never thought I'd get to be in that show. I never thought that I could was a good enough actor to mm. do that. I, I was like, that's a scary show for real actors or something like that. I'm not fabulous enough. I'm not 
sharp-tongued enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not... All these sort of things that I sort of told myself to protect myself from the scary, wonderful, amazing thing that Angels in America is and that we've all studied in acting class. And now I sort of got the opportunity to do it. It came to me at the perfect time. I think a month before I would have been like, hell no, I'm way too scared. And suddenly I was like, bring it. This is exactly what I want and need to be doing. It's just funny how life gives you certain things exactly when you need them. I love that you challenge yourself. That's a very important thing for any artist to do is to challenge themselves. It's how you grow. Yeah, it is. It's how you grow. So I have one last question for you, which hey. is, and this is a great segue for that. What would your adult self, if you had the opportunity to talk to your younger self, what advice would you give them? Let go. It's stop gripping. <laughs> Here's what I would say. Yeah. Stop squirming. If I didn't want to be in a situation, I would squirm out of it or I wouldn't just sort of take another second to be there, be okay with what we're doing, what we're saying, what we're talking about, where we are, what where I am with myself. I've been meditating for nine years. That's helped. I think just sitting with myself and not being as sort of spastic and squirmy, mm -hmm. something that I would have loved to tell myself when I was a young man. I think it's interesting when we're younger, we have that yummy energy that just like turns into, and that is what propels us forward. But it's very important also to balance that out. When you say that it makes me, and I, I hope everybody else take a breath and just release to be able to know that that's the yin and yang of of us that's the yin and yang of life that's the balance to have that great ambitious energy but to also balance it with a chance to go inward to close your eyes to breathe to take a breath a full breath and just let it be how great is that for right now too that was so well said jerry <laughs> God, i try i wish we were recording this oh wait we are oh, we are <laughs> Spirit, I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. Such a pleasure. I know, I, right? You know, right before this, I was in the shower and I was sort of having a day and it's sort of weird and gloomy and smoggy and smoky and scary outside. And I was kind of like, I just need a, I need a little lift me up. And just coming here and talking to you and with you and about the arts just filled my heart and just is zooming me into the rest of my day. Aww. Thank you so much. Much, Jerry Thank Jones. you. We're giving Thank everybody virtual hugs right now. Virtual hug back. I feel it. Want to see more videos like this? Yeah, of course you do. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel right here and visit us at the Music Center offstage at our website, musiccenter.org. Until next time.